Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. A look at the biggest stories of the year tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, president and executive editor of The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined this week by a round table of journalists, starting with Toby Sells, news editor from the Memphis Flyer. Thanks for being here. Thank you, sir. Laura Faith Cabetta covers education for Chalkbeat. Thank you for being here again. Absolutely. Ryan Poe is a reporter with the Commercial Appeal. Thank you for being here. Sure thing. And Bill Drees is a reporter with The Daily Memphian. So I, I think we'll start, we can kind of ramble around and all many of the things that happened in this past year and then also how that kind of teased things up for this coming year. And we start maybe, Bill, with elections. It was a big election year, maybe on a national level, a local level, a statewide level, and a lot of sort of contrary and contradictory signals on some level. But recap some of the biggest highlights of this last election season. All right. Well, 2018 was an election year. Midterm elections is is what we're talking about here. Also, county general elections. Uh, and the county general elections, the reorganized Democratic Party uh, came back with, with something to actually surprise the Democratic Party leaders themselves. Uh, the Democratic nominee swept every single countywide office on the ballot this past year. Uh, they also improved the Democratic majority on the county commission from seven to eight in the process. Uh, now, there was a lot of talk, uh, starting with the May primaries, about a blue wave and whether that was statewide. I think the statewide results pretty much proved that Tennessee is still as a state, a very red and very conservative state. You had two statewide races for governor and U.S. Senate, both of them taken by the Republican nominees over respectable Democratic nominees who, who had some wins in their record. And a tremendous amount of money. A, yeah, a, a lot of money on both sides of the equation here. So that, that part really didn't represent change. Although, if you look at the race for governor, for the first time, since Winfield Dunn was elected governor in 1970, a Republican governor was followed by a Republican governor. Usually our, our habit since, since Dunn, who was from Memphis, is from Memphis, won that governor's race in 1970 was that we elected a Republican, we followed with a Democrat, we followed with a Republican, and just alternated between the two. That pattern was broken this year in the governor's race. And with Winfield Dunn, we'll now have sort of a Jeopardy segment on every behind the headlines <laughs> in 2019. But I will go with, to you, Ryan. I mean, that, the Democratic Party locally uh, was broken up. I mean, was was basically had to disband uh, because of so many problems they had just a couple of years ago. Now you've got Lee Harris, you've got all the people that Bill talked about. Again, in contrast to, you know, people thought that, that Carl Dean would maybe get some traction. He was something of an underdog on the Democratic side. Um, and that, that Bredesen would give Marsha Blackburn a run, and she really didn't. And yet, in Shelby County, both of those candidates won handily. And that that it's hard to kind of make sense of that in some way. Well, I, I think that what you saw, what you're seeing across the spectrum is that uh, people who vote Democrat are voting solidly Democrat and people who vote Republican are voting solidly Republican and there's not as much uh, intermingling as there used to be. So what that means in Ch Memphis and Shelby County is that if Democrats vote Democrat, Democrats win every election pretty much. So um, and that's that's kind of what, we're, what we saw uh, this year and, and what I kind of expect we're going to see in future elections. I think the Democratic Party has made a full recovery. They're, they're back uh, good, got strong leadership. It's going to be hard for Republicans to, you know, overcome them. And, and Laura Faith, from an education point of view, we talked about Bill Lee as governor, um, and we talked, you know, the state legislature did not particularly change its makeup. It's a heavily Republican state legislature. The state has huge impact on local education. I mean, people remember consolidation and deconsolidation, but much of the funding locally comes through the state. TN Ready, the testing, I mean, it goes on and on. What do you see with any change with this change in people, but not party at the state level? 
Well, a fourth of the General Assembly is going to be new to Capitol Hill this year, and several of the key education committee's leadership is also changing. And so um, that changes the um, just the, pow the power dynamic of who's making those decisions. But with Bill Lee, um, he has you know put a lot of energy behind um, education in his campaign, and he's talked a lot about um, uh, family choice and being able to give more choices to families, which in, in this um, time and age would be talking about private school tuition vouchers, which has come up again and again in Tennessee, but hasn't yet um, passed all the hurdles. And so, um, but also with T and Ready, that's one of the biggest headaches that the state has had in the past few years. Um, with the online implementation, there's been huge technical glitches every year. This and is the testing that, that kids take and teachers are judged and school funding, school, are schools failing? I mean, the, the tests are not just guideposts, they, they define a lot of how the various schools can operate and can't operate, right? Right, absolutely. And so there's going to be um, an RFP coming out soon to be able to get more companies um, talking about whether they can take over operations from the previous uh, testing vendor, which is a change from another testing vendor that also had technical difficulties. So um, it'll be really interesting to see how Bill Lee um, uh, shepherds all of those changes and who he names as education commissioner. Toby, tell you, you want to stay in elections or other things that, that strike you about this, this year past? Before we leave elections, uh, this year on the Memphis City Council, we saw uh, three sitting council members, uh, Edmund Ford Jr., Janice Fullilove, and Bill Morrison win county seats in separate elections, uh, creating three vacancies on the board. They all held onto their seats um, to give enough time uh, for the sitting council members to, uh, to appoint people to those, those seats. Uh, before the year was up last year, we saw them try to fill one of those seats, and it was a mess up there. Uh, how many, did they take more than 100 votes uh, one night yeah. uh, to, to, try to, to try to fill one of those seats and still couldn't do it? Uh, they ended up punting there at the very end and say, we're going to deal with this in 2019. So that's still on the, that's still on the agenda uh, for the council uh, right now as, as we start 2019. And uh, they're operating now as a 10-member council, I guess, on the legal basis from uh, an opinion from uh, their attorney, Alan Wade. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how the council kicks off 2019 and how we fill those seats. And, and I mean, your take on the council, I mean, that is one of the big stories. And, you know, city council, I kind of, you know, you contrast what happened, what is happening now with those vacancies with a few years ago, they were so proud that when they brought the budget up in the summer, it was maybe an hour or so of discussion. And then, you know, they voted and the committee process had worked well and there were no surprises or no drama. They, they prided themselves, this council, for, I don't know, much of the last year and a half on being very organized, not a lot of the shenanigans that people talk about in the past, the fighting, this sort of, it all fell apart, it felt like. Yeah, um, yeah I think those days are gone at this point. <laughs> but um, I think what, what really interests me, I have no idea what's gonna happen in the future with uh, those appointments, but I do think what's gonna be interesting uh, to watch is in October, we're gonna have the city elections, and that is going to be a big opportunity for some of these people who have just hated on the city council for all these months to come over and try to elect new council members with instant runoffs, uh, which is possibly going to happen. <laughs> so so I, I think that's, that's a big story to watch is kind of how, what happened with the council. It, it might be entirely different council later yeah. this year. In, instant runoff voting, which we will not attempt to do my math, my, my ch mathematically challenged <laughs> description of instant runoff voting, but we, all of you have, have written, most all of you have written about it extensively, but that was not overturned this last year in this election season. So Ryan makes a good point, Bill. As we go into the election, how many, let's just do some basics. Are all the city council seats up or is it just, yes. a, it'll all be all 13. all 13 of them. Some of those will be, three of those ostensibly will be interim positions, people who may or may not get appointed by the city council in the next you know, period of time. Mm -hmm. Then the city mayor is up. Who else is up in uh, at the city level next year? City court clerk. Okay. Um, and, and so let's, start, let's stay with council and then we'll go mayor's race. I mean, are some of these people who are being you know, put forward as uh, interims and maybe not getting voted in, are, do we expect to see them run for the permanent seats? I mean, is this the beginning of the campaign on some level? Virtually all of them you, you, you could expect to run for the seat if they get the appointment. Maybe even, even if they don't get the appointment, they may show up again on the October ballot. Um, so, so yeah, the, they, they will be players in that. You also have three council members who are term limited who will be going off. So uh, with the appointments, I, I mean, we've certainly seen 
people who were appointed to council seats uh, wind up not winning a full term. Uh, you know, yeah. that's how Janice Fullylove uh, got on the city council was by defeating Henry Hooper uh, in the 2007 elections. We saw both of the appointees that year defeated in the election when they went for a full term on it. Uh, as for instant runoff voting, Ryan's right. This is not exactly a done deal yet. Uh, the voters decided to keep instant runoff voting. They also decided to keep the runoff provision in the city charter, which instant runoff voting is meant to negate so that you don't have a runoff. I'm not getting into the weeds, I promise. <laughs> I know, over there, uh, over there. But, uh, but so, so, so that conflict, among others, still has to be worked out. Uh, there are some questions before an administrative law judge that, that deal with, with uh, whether instant runoff voting has, has now been affirmed by voters. Does that stand? But the state election commission and state election officials have not authorized the use of instant runoff voting in Tennessee. Um, let's switch to the mayor's race. I mean, I don't anyone, you know, in terms of Strickland, uh, it, he is hasn't declared that he's going to run, but he's quite obviously he's, going to he's run. Gonna run. He's yeah. been running. I mean, you know, it, but that that's just kind of the way it works often. Other people who may come forward. Do you want to make any predictions, Ryan? You know, I, I think at this point, I. Harrington, Willie Harrington is, is the only one who has really declared that is a, you know, very strong opposition. Uh, LaMichael Wilson, I believe, is another uh, who has declared. But, um, yeah, Harrington is coming out with Make, Ameri Make Memphis Great Again hats and T-shirts, so he seems like he's serious. I, you know, whether he has a shot, that's another question. All right. Um, let's switch to back to you, Laura, in terms of education. Probably the, one of the biggest stories of the year had to be Dorsey Hobson uh, after five years as superintendent um, resigned, moving on to the private sector. An interim has been named. Talk a little bit about Dorsey Hobson's legacy and what's next for that position. Well, he wasn't the only leader to change uh, this year in, in education. Uh, we, in the first in, in May, we had a surprise move by Sharon Griffin, who was um, a longtime Memphis uh, school leader who founded the, um, the I-Zone, which is a group of schools um, that were the lowest performing in the state that have made a lot of gains in these years. She uh, switched to um, the state-run Achievement School District in May. Um, of course, we had Candace McQueen take herself out of the running for um, uh, the next state education commissioner. Um, and by resigning to go into the private sector, Dorsey Hobson also took him, his name off the, the, um, the plate as far as um, a statewide office. Um, but so far we have an interim superintendent, Dr. Joris Ray, and he um, started his uh, career also in Memphis schools um, and has been with the district for a long time. And so um, right now he's, he's talked about wanting to, be, um, to go for the permanent position as well. Um, but we'll see how the school board uh, shapes what that search will look like this they, year. They have talked about the school board, talked about doing a national search? Is that yeah, correct? they haven't contracted anyone yet or given any sort of details quite yet, but that'll be coming up soon. And, and Dorsey was um, it's somewhat atypical in that he was not, a, he had not been a superintendent anymore. He was general counsel through what consolidation, deconsolidation, all the kind of difficulties of five, six years ago. Uh, Krenner Cash left, who had been the city school. Um, superintendent, he was named, am I right that Dorsey was named interim, and then they've kind of found that they liked him, I mean, as a non-traditional, somewhat non-traditional well, superintendent. Uh, also, John Atkin left to become superintendent of the Collierville yeah. school system later right. on, and so Dorsey became but the choice. Is there some sense that, I remember years ago there was the thing, you know, everybody superintendent should be a former general. I mean, remember that everyone wanted to hire, because people, you know, public, <laughs> public, <laughs> public education, you know, is, is so much difficulty, and so they wanted non-traditional superintendents to come in. Have you heard any noise about that, about the kind of person they're looking for, the, the school board? Um, well, for a while they talked about, um, you know, when they were talking about who to name as the interim, they talked about, um, you know, do we want someone who is going to be, who's going to go for the permanent position might, that might um, detract from uh, other national folks looking into the position saying, oh, well, you know, I don't have much of a chance. So the way they've talked, it sounds like they're open to having someone coming out uh, outside of Memphis. Um, but that would that would be a first in a while. Last thought on this. One. They they had in, in, in picking Dr. Joris Ray for this. The other contenders were Lynn Johnson, who's the who's the CFO, Chief Financial Officer of the school system, and the third contender, 
was Dr. Carol Johnson, who was the superintendent before Kreiner Cash. So I, I think there's gonna be a pretty interesting discussion among the board members about this, maybe something along the lines of, do we, ha having had an outsider, someone who is not an educator, do we now hand off his work to an educator or do we go for more change along those lines? And, and I would say, we'll move on, but it, it was interesting on the way out that it, you know uh, they, Dorsey Hobson and his staff introduced this plan of closing, what, some 20 schools proposing to build, maybe is it 10 or 12 more schools, invest some $700 million in an incredibly transformative plan that he kind of presented, laid out, and said, I'm, now I'm, I'm going to move on. Nice and it'll be interesting to see how much, <laughs> yeah. of, uh, how much of that transformation, because Dorsey Hobson, it, it was an interesting interview that we did with him just a couple weeks ago. Um, it was transformative in, in, in his role, and the number of schools he closed, the number of, ch the amount of change was pretty remarkable. Um, we'll go on, Toby, from last year, other, other things that strike you uh, that, that really stood out in terms of last year? Sure, uh, you know, kind of an overall uh, story arch is, uh, you know, a lot of response to some of the policies from uh, President Donald Trump. Uh, you know, we saw uh, many, many protests in Memphis uh, uh, against his policies. We had the Women's March, and then we had several marches against his immigration policies. Uh, we also had some uh, other marches and protests here about local issues. Uh, last year, we saw a lot of activism, a lot of protests, um, and you know, kind of some of the response by the, the Memphis Police Department uh, to how they handled all that. And it kind of cum accumulated in a, uh, a lawsuit toward the end of the year. ACLU won a lawsuit against the Memphis Police Department that said that uh, the MPD broke a 1978 consent decree on uh, you know political surveillance of of, the, of its people, and and that. Uh, that lawsuit basically is going to have uh, the police change the way that they uh, that they watch the citizens here in Memphis. You talk about protests, and we talked about elections, and Tam, maybe I already said this, but you know it is somewhat symbolic. Tammy Sawyer is the you know somewhat leader of the protest movement now on the county commission, as we discussed. But back to MPD, um, isn't it recently, Ryan, that the mayor's office has talked about how they've had a net gain in police officers. I mean, that's been something, that was something that Jim Strickland ran on, that we had to reverse, you know, the, the police force went from some 24, 2,500 to under 2,000, and they've seen, after a, putting a lot of classes through the academy and so on, a net increase. Is that a beginning of a theme also of the upcoming election um, in terms of, you know, crime and safety and so on? I, I think that is definitely going to be part of the theme of the election. Um, Mayor Strickland ran in 2015 on public safety, on increasing the police force, on reducing crime, and he has done done that. Generally speaking, he's uh, the crime is generally down, violent crime is, uh, property crime is up a little bit, um, but but yeah, he he has in, uh, turned around the police force. Um, we have bottomed out, I believe, and and are going to start seeing an increase in officers now. Uh, other thoughts on on you know criminal justice and the police department from this last year and going into next year. The the surveillance lawsuit was was to me a a pretty huge development and and it it signified to me that that the protest the upswing in protest and the new activism that we've seen really turned a corner in this in this past year with that lawsuit and with a lot of uh, people involved in these protests moving from protest to other forms of activism. And I, I, I think the shining example of that was Tammy Sawyer's election to the Shelby County Commission. Uh, the leader of the, of the Take Em Down 901 movement that that was certainly a large part of the Confederate monuments being removed from two city parks, as well as the administration's lawsuit and other efforts in that regard. And there's still a lot of, a lot of friction between uh, the establishment, quote unquote, and the folks who are challenging the way that the city continues to do things. What you're saying with the city, I wanna come back to education, and, and I may be throwing you off here, Laura, but. The, it is, it's an interesting thing that people talk about, you know, okay, most important things, challenges Memphis face, and they might say crime, they might say economic development, most everyone will say education. And that in a direct way, the city council and the mayor have no particular funding or control over education. I mean, all that was given up as part of the consolidation, deconsolidation. However, Jim Strickland talked about pre-K and other city leaders have talked about pre-K. Where do we stand with that, with this idea of universal pre-K or expanding pre-K for to all kids who want it and need it. 
So there has been um, a pledge from um, from the mayor's office for $6 million for pre-K efforts. Um, haven't seen that uh, materialize quite yet, um, but there has um, that that line still of we got out of the education business with the with the um, with the merger is still um, the the main line. Um, but you've also seen the um, suburb towns put in money to their school system, so it's it's not something that they are um, banned from doing, but it, that has been the um, the line that has yeah, been the, the, touted. Yeah, say Germantown, Collierville, other places have put sales tax money, whatever money that they raise locally into their local school system. Nothing prohibits the Mem Memphis City Council or the mayor's office from putting money into right. the, the school system, the Shelby County school system. Right? But but the city, but I mean I don't think anyone thinks that's going to happen anytime well, soon. Well, and, and and the uh, cautionary note here is that if the city were to start funding public education again. Um, by state law, which the city council challenged back in 2008, they would be obligated to continue that funding under most circumstances because of the state's maintenance of effort requirements. You can't just do it one, that one says, year when you have some extra money. Right. You, yeah. you, you can't just give some money one year and then reduce that or take that away the next year. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of, at least in my brain, similar thing is, is Lee Harris elected uh, as Shelby County mayor. Um, and it has said that the county should begin to look to get into funding MATA and transportation. I mean, it, that is a shift that that has not been something the county has done. It's not clear if that's going to happen, but that he is even advocating for that um, was a big shift, right? I think it was a big shift, and, and I think you are seeing a lot of momentum for that proposal. I think you're going to continue to see uh, the county kind of invest in these kind of big picture ideas that might improve the overall county, maybe not focused so narrowly on just the county and what the county does, but kind of try to elevate the whole area. Um, I think one area to keep an eye on in 2019 is sports betting. I think um, Ramesh Akberi uh, is proposing to legalize sports betting and tax it 10%. Local state uh, stand, senator from state senator. Memphis up in the legislature. And she, uh, she wants to uh, tax it 10% and give 30% of that those tax revenues back to Shelby County or Memphis or other jurisdictions um, for specifically education and for public infrastructure, including for MATA. So, yeah. so we could see some real funding kind of come around through various groups, you know, various initiatives right. like that. We and, and I think that yeah, also um, connects back to education because when you're talking about transportation in a, a system that um, does have neighborhood zones to go to school, but um, but you do have open enrollment to go to a school that's not in your neighborhood, they don't always provide transportation. And so a lot of families rely on public transportation or rides to get there. Um, but with the transportation system in the, the, the shape that it's in, that makes it even harder for people to take advantage of the choices that they have. It, it, I'm glad you brought up the gambling thing. I mean, we did a story today at the Daily Memphis, and I think you all have written, I mean, I think you all will if you have it is a huge issue I mean, mm -hmm. because you think about the money that could be raised and I don't want to get into the morality so much but just the, the economics of it there's a tremendous amount of money that can be raised there's a lot of question about how that plays out for communities that get into gambling but you've also got the idea that you know Memphis loses all these, these dollars tourism um, workers down to Tunica I mean that's been you know people on Beale Street restaurant owners nightclubs have said hey we can't compete with the money that, 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 that servers get paid waiters get paid bartenders and so on it will be interesting to see if this very conservative legislature that we talked about. Um, I think Nashville's made a bit of a push that they would like to see legalized gambling of some sort, mm -hmm. Memphis now, and see if it really plays out because it'll be that urban, suburban, urban rural divide really playing out over this kind of, of issue. There's also an NBA and NFL divide on this too. Memphis has the Grizzlies and the NBA, obviously. The NBA likes the idea of having a sports book. Uh, the NFL, on the other hand, the Titans and Nashville included, uh, have some real problems with sports gambling. Uh, so they're, they're, the, the state's two largest cities could differ somewhat on that. Uh, but th this is the first time in a long time that we've heard about competition from Tunica on the gaming front, and it's a sports book, and it's because in Mississippi, they were basically waiting for this Supreme Court ruling and setting the stage for it. and within, I think, a month of the Supreme Court ruling, there was a sports book open in Tunica. Yeah. 
Just another story that, uh, that I thought was really transformative in, in 2018 was uh, that the Riverfront Development Corporation was, uh, was kind of overtaken. We've got a new leader in Carol Coletta, who's a Kresge Fellow senior, uh, senior fellow rather. Uh, it's now called the Memphis uh, River Parks Partnership, and they took the reins in April, and they have already made so many new things with the river line, and we've got new parks and plans to do all kinds of things. Uh, the Riverfront was also part of the uh, added to a, an existing tourist development zone there. So we're going to see new money kind of flow in there. I think it's going to be a huge year for the riverfront in 2019. Uh, I'm really excited about that. Also, uh, 2019 is our bicentennial. We talked earlier and uh, we're going to see kind of the, this new plan, this Memphis 3.0 plan come out and the, the headline of the plan, uh, the Strickland administration has been working on it for years now, is uh, we're going to grow up and not out. And we've already seen some of that put in place with deannexation of some areas out in the county uh, and also turning off some sewer taps and things like that out in the county. So that's going to be really interesting to watch. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about growing up, not out, I mean, you know, you've got this Union Row, nearly $1 billion project that's been proposed, mm -hmm. transformation of the Racket Club, a couple of big breweries, I mean, million dollar sort of brewery right. pubs. These are not small things. Um, you've got the Brooks, you talked about the TZ on the riverfront. I mean, that's a $100 million museum. That's not going to happen next year, but right. we're going to start seeing more and more plans if that's really going to happen. Um, Wolf River Parkway, I mean, Wolf River Greenway, excuse me, mm -hmm. connecting from downtown and some of the things you talked about all the way out eventually to Germantown. And again, you know, hotels just around our office downtown. I mean, you know, there are three hotels in old uh, buildings that have been effectively abandoned since I've been downtown 20, almost 20 years now that they're just all these things are happening. And that's even separate from the proposals of big convention center level hotels. So I'm glad you mentioned development, but we are out of time. So thank you all for being here and thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.